Thank you. Hi, so um, I'm Gareth. I'm Head of Insight and Research in NHS Blood and Transplant. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we use location analysis to help the aims of our organisation and ultimately help improve and save people's lives. So a little bit of the agenda, a little bit about who NHS Blood and Transplant is, as it's not always obvious who we are. A little bit about why we use location analysis and then a few of our challenges, one around a certain type of blood group and then a couple of bespoke challenges around opening up new uh, collection centres for blood across England. So this is a bit about NHS blood and transplants. Um, you may not know us as an organisation, but you probably know our work. Um, we were founded in 2006 as a merger between UK Transplant and the National Blood Service. So most of you in the room have probably heard about blood donation and organ donation. In England, we manage the collection of blood and across the UK, we manage the collection of organs. And we collect around one and a half million of units of blood up to that, it's about 1.4 million this year predicted, from around 800,000 donors at about 25 fixed centres and 1,300 mobile sites. We also collect around 65,000 units of platelets a year from uh, 13,000 odd donors at fixed sites. And we're just starting to collect plasma for the first time uh, in about 30 years um, from three fixed sites. And we have, that's actually been out of date. We've been very successful with plasma. I think that's nearer 9,000 now. Um, we transplanted over 4,000 organs from around 1,400 deceased donors. We manage an organ donation registry of over 25 million records. The Pulse blood donor system has around 5 million records plus 5 million donors on, uh, plus around another 5 million in the archive as we're required to keep records for 30 years. Uh, we have about 5,000 staff, three processing centres and one tissue bank. And why do we use location analysis? Well, it's, um, we're actually going to talk about marketing theory a little bit. So the four P's of marketing, product, place, price, promotion. Um, it's from Kotler and Keller. Um, if you've ever done business studies or anything, you might have the misfortune to read those books. They're pretty long and dry. And someone always points out that the Irish marketer P.R. Smith added another three. Uh, that's people, process and physical experience to the groups. But really, uh, as blood donation, it's a voluntary activity. And the same with organs. We need to essentially promote our products. So we, we do do quite a bit of marketing. Um, and the theories of product, product price, place and promotion. Um, we can only control two of them because the product is pretty much set. We're not Sony. We can't innovate innovate and create a Walkman. The price of blood is set by the government. So we can only really control the place and the promotion. So how do we market and where do we market or where do we collect? And that's why place is so important to us, that mix of the marketing. So I'll talk a little bit about the tools we use. Um, you don't have to use the tools, there are other ones out there. So we use CACI's Insight Mapping Tool, but there are other tools out there. There's Map Info, which I used to use when I worked in the police, but there's also free tools like QGIS, and there's also Esri as well. Um, Insight is the mapping tool we choose. It's quite unique because it uses postcode data rather than a lot of other ones will, can use MSOAs. It makes it great for some data points, slightly more challenging for others, but it means we can upload data um, as long as it's got a postcode. So we talked about partnerships with a major supermarket. We're actually able, someone has published a spreadsheet online with all the postcodes of that supermarket. We can upload that. Um, we can convert some of the census data to that, but the package we have has all the census data uploaded by CACI along with their ACORN Geodem data, and that's updated each year. And when CACI update the Geodem data, they all go through and update the census data in the same methodologies as the ONS. So we get very up-to-date data at a, a postcode level. We've also got specialist data in there. So we have retail data to start to show how busy an area is in terms of spend. And then we also have app data from, to show footfall. So how many people are passing through an area? So we have all these data packages brought in to try and understand what the locations are like and what's gonna be the best location to collect blood in or give us the best chance. We can also, I mentioned about other data sets we can add in, we can add in transport data. Um, transport London has some great data sets. I managed recently to upload all the bus routes in London and you can filter them. It's just to show the bus routes from one point going out to another. 
I like maps, I like buses, I'm a bit of a geek, and that really, I really was quite pleased with that. Um, I'm going to talk about one of our challenges, and this is probably one of our biggest challenges we're facing in blood donation over the years. So this is about, this is a RO, it's a type of blood, and it's really, really useful to treat sickle cell. Um, so sickle cell is a, disorder, is a disease where about 15,000 people are affected. Um, it's more prevalent than cystic fibrosis, and it's an inherited blood disorder that causes misshapen red blood cells, as you can see on the top right image and it blocks blood vessels, blood flow, and causes really painful crises. So painful that, they're often, that uh, sufferers are often required to have morphine in hospital. And one of the best transfusions is, uh, one of the best treatments is a transfusion with um, very closely matched blood. And this RO blood is one of the best matches for most people who suffer from sickle cell. It's very rare. It's found in about 2% of the population overall but that's not true for every population. So it can be found in up to 60% of some African communities and up to about 40% of some Caribbean communities. So the challenge we have is to significantly grow this donor base and also recruit blood donors from communities who've typically been quite hard for us to reach as an organization. And the demand for this blood group is growing year on year. 40 years ago, most sickle, cell people, most sickle cell sufferers probably wouldn't get past their 30s. Now many of them are having grandchildren. So that you can see why that the effective treatments are helping people with sickle cell live longer. It also creates more of a problem for us as we've got to get more donors to treat people. But this is, one, this is the challenges we are facing. So um, I mentioned that this is, these communities are often some of the hardest ones to reach through for, for us as a blood donation organization. The other challenge we have is NHS blood and transplant is being, we're formed in the 1940s out of the back of the Second World War and the RAF and we're quite a rural organization. We're traditionally market towns and shires and when we look at population data the most diverse communities are in our city centres and particularly London. So we've actually got a shift where we go as an organization. And by using all this data, we started off by looking at where we could target our marketing. So we've got postcode level data. We can then market in the correct areas. We can target for you via um, online, but we can also look to work with community groups in the areas. And we also set up a new mobile blood donation team to get into the communities, be a part of the communities and collect blood in the communities. So that was the first thing we did with the IRO challenge to try and improve our marketing, to try and be there in the communities. But it really wasn't enough. And local community groups were saying that we needed to have a donor center and a visible presence, going back to, I mentioned PR Smith and a physical presence of, we need to be seen to be in the community. So we wanted to have a blood donation center in the heart of the black community in London. So we use population data to identify the hotspots um, for where a, a population. We then, as you can see in this very, very busy map on the right, what we did is we overlaid it with all sorts of other data sets on there. So the green blobs there on there represent the retail spend and the footfall. So we're actually able to see how much the, the, the hotspots match up with where people are going. The dots on the map represent um, train stations. So we took TfL and National Rail data and looked to see where the busiest train stations were, trying to identify the busiest hotspots. And then we took our footfall data, which is traditionally at, Ac well, we get it at Acorn level, which isn't great for trying to break things down by ethnicity. But it has um, one very clever thing at the bottom there where it's ringed. What it does is it looks at the groups who are in the area about how far they traveled so we can not only see where the people are living, we can see that actually some areas have very high proportions of local visitors and local residents traveling perhaps only two or three miles into these retail areas. And by doing this, we're able to gather enough evidence to identify some suitable areas for a donor center. One was Brixton, one was Peckham, and one was Lewisham. And when we're doing that, we have challenges because Ultimately, trying to find property in London or anywhere can be a real challenge. Trying to find property to meet our very specific needs. Um, you know, we have to have certain types of floors in case blood gets spilt. So there's all sorts of things we have to consider. 
So it can be a real challenge finding property. So having that data there and actually then keep referring back whenever there's a challenge, whenever it says, you know what, we're really struggling to find there. Why don't we just go and get a nice office space in Croydon? We can go, no, back to the map. That map is telling, it's saying we need to be in these communities. We need to keep on searching. And that was really important because one of the people driving the project at one point was retiring in three months and wanted to have the property signed, sealed by the time they retired. Thankfully, we're able to use the data to say, nah, we're gonna, we need to stay here. What we have got now is we've got a, do a donor center opening in Brixton. Um, on the map there, if you know Brixton, it's just by the station. It's a really busy area, just right by the bridge. It's got a lovely frontage and it curves around, so it's really visible. Um, it's opening, hopefully, in 2024. And one of the challenges with all these donor centers is they take a really long time to open. And that's one of the one of the challenges we'll come on to soon. So after um, a pandemic, which we found quite difficult, um, we declared our first ever Amber Alert for blood in 2022, which we came very close to where our supplies were very, very low. And what we did as a t insights team is we were tasked with working on a project to identify where we could open up new donor centres. The government had given us money, they didn't want this, they decided that we should open up some more donor centres to increase capacity to avoid this ever happening again. And what we did is we used a technique called cookie cutter. We used our insight tool and it's very, very, it's used by a lot of retail companies. So um, B&Q use it, for example, where to place the branches. So what we did is we, identif we, we filtered down to towns of a certain size and then we asked the program to find places that would not impact our other donor centres and come up with a list of donor centres and areas that would be suitable. That was then refined by other team members um, who used a matrix to help decide which areas would be great for perhaps recruiting even more donors of black heritage, which groups, which area would help release perhaps mobile capacity in a town, and then the mobile team can go and serve the country areas around the town or which areas are really good and fulfilling a, an untapped demand of um, new blood donors. We've got a sensor opening in Brighton very soon, thanks to this method. The big challenges we had was finding donor centers took so long and senior execs got quite impatient. So that was one of our real challenges um, with the donor centers. So this year, bear in mind that this project's taken so long, we've only got one of the donor centers out of the six, though Brixton's now been included we've got a new challenge, which is to open more mobile sessions. So what we wanted to do was an analysis to look at where we open more mobile sessions. And all our previous analysis has been on fixed sites. We could talk to CACI and say, look, how does your retail partner do this? And they, you know, it's been used by banks, B&Q, cinemas. There's loads of great use cases. But mobiles are really different. You don't need such a big population. Um, they can move around, although we don't use blood and bills anymore. And what we did is um, so one of the team started to dive into the data and do a lot of really good statistical analysis and exploration. And they came up with some rules. Um, and the rules were quite simple. They were to have a donation center with, or mobile center with no more than 4,000 appointment slots a year, to have a population and a post sector of, no, of more than 10,000, and that population, at least half of it, must be working age. And we're actually, that was then passed over and we have to visualize it quite quickly and come up with these areas and then just look at the maps, group the areas and come up with a long list. And that's one of the maps there. Um, we've, we slightly tweaked the boundaries. We, we made, we're a bit more conservative and increased the working age up to 55%. One of the really good points of the um, analysis was that we're actually able to, um, just create some new rules and exploration was really useful. We got a really nice rule of thumb for if we deploy X many appointments, how much do we actually collect? Because previously the organization, they'd have a percentage here, a percentage there. We had a really nice straight line. It's a really strong uh, statistical link. So we've got some really good outputs out there from the data exploration. So another great advert for just people just taking time to explore the data. So these mobile sessions, um, we went to a program board uh, th this week. We've got approval to target um, two areas to open up a, a very, very large new mobile program. Um, so it, it, this isn't in Corby, but there's two large areas that we identified. And um, so um, these are the results so far. Um, 
We've, despite the pandemic and our overall decline of blood donors, we've increased the number of RO donors by 16% in the last three years. We've grown the number of donors of black ethnicity um, by 42%. And the number of donors in Brixton, since we decided to open the centre and we've been building the donor base, has risen by 83%. And actually, the results are going to be really are going to take longer than that to really filter through. So the Brighton Donor Centre um, will probably take four or five years to get to maturity. And what would be a really good result for Brighton is it's not the biggest city in the UK, but if it can have a donor base close to the size of a much bigger urban conurbation like maybe Nottingham or Leeds and have eight to 10,000 donors, it'll be very much like the city's football team. That is, you know, a few years ago, it was almost relegated from the Football League now it's a very solid Premier League performer. It's never going to win the league, but it's a very, very solid performer. And that's the aim for Brighton and the aim for Brixton, but I couldn't use the football analogy because there's no um, Premier League team in Brixton. So um, that's it for me. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, a quick plug that if you haven't um, registered in the organ donation, register to do that. And if you've made a decision, please share that decision with your family. And yeah, please consider blood or plasma donation. We've got two lovely mascots, Billy the Blood Drop and Pippa, I don't know what the plasma is, but Pip, Pippa the Plasma mascot. Um, please, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gareth. <laughs> there's an opportunity to come up with a better name than Pippa the Plasma. <laughs> I'm sure there, there's it. So um, some quick questions for uh, Gareth. I think the first one, I think I know the answer to this, but... Uh, um, we will ask you, you're the expert. Can you ever have too much blood? Um, as a person? to spare blood? Well, I think as an individual, <laughs> that may be a problem. Yeah. Um, um, as, a, as an organisation, um, we rarely... We, we, we know that blood is precious, so we rarely waste it. Um, very, you know, very few units actually don't make it into um, a patient's arm. Um, collecting millions of units, there's always a few that get, you know, we've had cases of vans driving off with a few bags of blood on the roof and they've obviously had to be discarded. But generally, virtual blood is used. Um, if it isn't used directly for uh, a blood transfusion, some of it is used to make reagents, which are the testing kits. And without that, we couldn't have transfusion. So it's almost always used. And some parts of the blood can be used for other products. So we can take platelets out of a whole blood donation and plasma as well. Friends, please sit down. You could join us. You know, obviously you made poor choices and went to other sessions, but you can join us now. That's okay. We're all friends here. And uh, um, so another quick question. Um, I know that you've talked a lot about the, the very complex work about looking at where best to place things, yeah. to, to, to hit certain markets. And I love this idea of marketing to, yeah. to better understand those audiences. Um, have you thought about using NHS hospital space, NHS properties, so, um, even if it's just for staff donations? Yes, um, we... That we've made some political decisions in an organisation to collect less in sort of industrial places, which sometimes includes hospitals. But we have sites on hospitals. One of our most successful um, donation centres in London is in Tooting on the back of St George's. Uh, we have one at Edgware on a hospital site. We have Cambridge, Oxford, uh, Bristol's on a hospital site, Lancaster, I think Newcastle. Um, I think that's, yeah, so we do collect on some hospital sites. Fantastic. And if you're, if you're volunteering your hospital site or NHS building, I'm sure Gareth would uh, most probably be interested. Oh, definitely. The service would be interested um, too. Do you find the media has an impact on the numbers of donors? I'm thinking about Netflix shows, Supercell, and, um, and the theme of sickle cell. Do you um, ever link this kind of analysis to in there? To, so, to? yeah, and the media has an impact on donors. Um, generally, the biggest constraint is how much we can collect, the sessions and how much we need. Um, but actually, if you're looking at people registering an interest to donate, the media can really drive that. When we launch with a big national campaign, we can get tens of thousands of registrations in a day. And it also people come back and book appointments. So, yeah, the media is a very key part of our mix. And PR is certainly a really useful tool to drive donations. Fantastic. As we're waiting for our friends and colleagues to join us, because obviously I know you're waiting for the, the, the fantastic end of day.